just going to wait uh, one more minute until uh, we have a few more connected. Okay, you can see over 200 uh, people connected, lots more coming in. Just give it 30 seconds more before we start our webinar on encouraging heat pump installations in Ireland. Okay, so we're up to about 220 and I think I'll get started. So I'd like to officially welcome you all uh, to the webinar this morning. And as I said, the topic is encouraging heat pump installations uh, in Ireland. Uh, we'll have a couple of presentations uh, and then some question and answers. So there's a good chance for us to understand your questions and get your ideas uh, and uh, to discuss those. So please feel free to ask uh, as many questions as, as you can as, as they occur to you using the Q&A function uh, in the webinar. We're going to keep the session going until about midday uh, to get through as much as we can. Uh, my name is Jim Shear and I'm Head of Data and Insights at SEAI uh, and we deliver Ireland's national energy statistics, uh, energy modelling uh, and projections uh, and of course the work of the Behavioural Economics Unit which is uh, featured here today. Uh, the Behavioural Economics Unit is led by uh, Carl Purcell, who, who you'll hear a presentation from today, and the work being presented was contributed to by Mark Boacek and also uh, Andrew O'Callaghan. The, the Behavioural Economics Unit spend their time working out ways to encourage measurable changes to homeowners and businesses' energy behaviour uh, by using the latest evidence from behavioural science and, and economics. And they're generating a new evidence base for Ireland uh, through their research and when they're not on lockdown they're uh, conducting experiments and field trials uh, to design and, and, and test uh, impactful behaviour change strategies. And part of that strategy is, is to evaluate the outcomes of uh, those trials at a small scale before working to implement them uh, at a large scale across uh, government uh, and SEAI programs. Uh, to get their work out there to you all and to generate discussion uh, and, and insights from, from that research and also from, from the community, many of you who, who are on the webinar today, um, the team has uh, put together uh, a policy uh, paper series. Each paper includes a review of the best available evidence from the behavioural science literature uh, and maps out behavioural influences um, onto those relevant behaviours. Uh, and concludes with a list of potential policy solutions for further consideration by the policy makers. We're joined by uh, one of those uh, key people today as well. So far, uh, the team has produced two papers in the series and there are more on the way this year. The first paper was on uh, electric vehicles in Ireland and there was a webinar yesterday on that paper and the paper is available uh, currently on the SEII website if you're interested in that. Uh, and for those of you who missed the webinar, a recording will also be uh, made available to you so you can catch up. And the second paper is on heat pump adoptions, and that's our topic for today. In terms of the scope of uh, those behavioural uh, reports, just to mention very briefly, they're very much an outline of the behaviours and drivers to heat pump adoption in this case. And they include uh, an indication of possible measures to drive the uptake of that technology uh, for further consideration and ideas generation. Uh, and that's part of why we're here today, is to, to, to keep generating those ideas and hear from you all and present to you this work. The, the, the reports are not a full economic evaluation, just to say that much. Those analyses, those economic analyses, have already been done separately to a large extent. There are more ongoing um, on, on an ongoing basis, but they've already pointed to heat pumps uh, and electric vehicles as being part of the solution as we look to decarbonise Ireland's energy system as fast as we can to 2030 and, and fully by 2050. We're, we're delighted to be uh, joined today by one of those policymakers that I mentioned, uh, Mr. Rob Deegan. He's head of residential energy efficiency at the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications. And I'm going to hand over first to Rob uh, for the policy context. Over to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks to yourself, Jim, Carl, and all in the SAI for the, the kind invitation to be here today. Um, I'd also like to thank Carl, of course, and his team for um, developing the paper, uh, which provides very important insights on the strategies that we're going to need to implement in order to maximise heat pump installation and uh, deliver energy savings over the coming decade and beyond. Uh, it, the paper really is a valuable resource um, and it'll help to shape the approaches uh, in terms of the design 
uh, development and implementation of the, the policies and measures that we're going to need to implement in the years to come. So, uh, as you say, Jim, I, I've asked, been asked just to give a little bit of policy context uh, for, 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 for the paper and, and for the, the installation of heat pumps. Um, as you'll see from the slide, the residential sector is the biggest contributor to heat emissions uh, and it accounted for 47% of uh, heat emissions overall. Uh, recognizing this and the need to address that, uh, the 2019 Climate Action Plan uh, committed Ireland to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the residential sector by between a third and a half uh, by 2030 and then setting a trajectory towards net zero uh, by 2050. So in order to achieve uh, that overarching target, uh, we, the, the, the measures that were uh, identified as being most effective and efficient way of achieving them was 500,000 uh, houses to a building energy rating of B2 or cost optimal uh, and the installation of 600,000 heat pumps and 400,000 of those heat pumps are to be in existing uh, buildings to replace uh, fossil fuel boilers. So. These targets represent a very significant uh, increase in both the volume and the depth uh, of retrofit activity in Ireland and a, and a transformation of the heating systems that we use. Uh, and achieving those targets, um, it, it really is going to lead to a transformed housing sector, uh, housing stock. Um, as we move away from fossil fuels uh, towards zero or low carbon fuels in the energy system. So, I suppose, how does this paper fit in with all that? While there's been good progress in recent years uh, on, on the area, it's been hindered by the implementation of, of, of widespread uh, implementation of, of heat pump technology has been hindered by several barriers. Uh, and they're identified and analyzed in depth in the paper. And, and really what, what makes this paper so welcome is that it's only really by developing a better understanding of the barriers to heat pump adoption and, and, and just as importantly, how to overcome them, that we can design the policies and measures uh, to, to scale up and, and actually achieve the targets. So at the moment, there is a wider context to the initiative as well. At a time when we're all spending more time in our home, uh, residential energy efficiency is at the forefront, not just of energy policy, but also a, a wider policy context. Uh, retrofitting of homes delivers a range of important benefits uh, from greenhouse gas emissions to, to, and, and the climate related targets. But at the moment in a COVID environment, it, it, it's equally important about the, the retention and development of high quality, sustainable jobs in communities right the way across the country. Uh, and then we've got the, the, the benefits of warmer, comfier, healthier homes as well. So it's, uh, there, 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 there's multiple benefits to this. So it really is about getting on and delivering them in line with the, 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 the graph that you can see on the right hand side of the, 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 the slide there and delivering the, the step change in, in, in delivery. So people need warm, healthy environments without a surge in home heating costs as they're spending more time, time at home. And heat pump insulation uh, offers the opportunity to, to, to meet those. Uh, so it's, it really is a pivotal moment for the government to promote sustainable energy policies and set us on the pathway to net zero by 2050. So I was only asked to give a kind of a quick overview, so I, I won't go on any further because I think there'll be time for questions at the end. But I'd just like to, again, congratulate Carl and the team uh, for, for the very good paper. And I'll hand it back over to Jim. Thanks, everyone. That's great, Rob. Thank you very much for that um, that policy context. And, and, and from that, I could see already how heat pumps fit into that wider energy system uh, decarbonisation goal, uh, the links to energy efficiency. So to see heat pumps as part of that wider retrofit agenda and, and the serious challenges of, of scaling up to this uh, this run rate, which would, which would be an unprecedented run rate in, in, in European terms. And there's, there's not a lot of member states to look to for um, delivering the scale on the scale that, that the Irish government's committed to here. So this is why I guess we've, we've had the economists and the engineers looking at this for a long time and now the behavioural science. So it's really great to, uh, to see that and to hear about also all the issues that will probably come up today in the chat around the need for skills, um, you know, to support the deployment here, uh, for finance offerings and all of those kind of things. So we're, we're going to zoom in now uh, and have a look at um, uh, how uh, we the, the, the research that Carl's undertaken and how we can drive uh, consumer choices towards uh, 
the technologies that we need for this transition, one of those, of course, uh, being heat pumps. So uh, thanks again, Rob. Uh, and Rob will be sticking around for the for the Q and A. So much appreciated there, Rob. And I'd like to hand you over now to the program manager of the Behavioural Economics Unit at SEAI, Carl Purcell, for his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Rob. And um, yeah, it, it's great to be able to contribute to this discussion with um, these, this paper series. That's exactly the intention of this paper series: is to generate discussions around potential uh, solutions that might help us achieve those goals, while, as I say, outline, outlining the barriers that uh, we need to overcome to, to ultimately achieve that objective. Um, so yeah, so thank you everyone again for, for attending today. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, apologize for my lockdown hair, but uh, as I'm sure most of you know, it's not possible to get a haircut at the moment, uh, so we'll make do. Um, today what I want to do is just give you a sense of what the findings in, from our paper were. And to set that in context, the aims and objectives of our paper really were to identify the barriers and drivers to heat pump adoption at each part of the adoption life cycle. So I'll show you the customer journey um, that we kind of came up with to outline that adoption life cycle. Identify the factors that influence the realization of the potential savings from heat pump adoption on Ireland. Because while it's really important that we install these heat pumps, it's also important that we install them correctly and have them operated efficiently in order to realize the full potential of both carbon emission savings and monetary savings for those who do install them. And then, of course, I'm going to touch on some potential strategies for increasing heat pump adoption in Ireland and realizing that higher operational efficiency that we all want to see. So I want to show you now just kind of an outline of a heat pump adoption customer journey that we put together for this paper. Um, but just to bear in mind that this customer journey was put together following uh, a large reading of the wider literature and not necessarily following you know, a group of homeowners through the heat pump adoption process in Ireland. I think it will map on quite nicely, um, but just, just to make that distinction. So there's really five stages in this customer journey as we see it, uh, from considering, to choosing, to organizing, to designing and installing, to operating. And just go through each of those and turn and talk a little bit of kind of what's involved at each of those stages. So considering stage, people aren't really actively researching heating technologies, but they might be forming opinions of them. So if you think about it this way, if you go to your friend's house and they happen to install a heat pump recently and they're telling you about it, or if you see an advertising campaign on TV, you might hear a little bit about heat pump technology, for example. And so in that sense, people are always forming opinions of these different technologies as they go about their daily lives. But in this considering stage, it's not like they're sitting down with the hard details of two or three different systems and, and trying to choose between them. That happens at the next stage, at the choosing stage. This is where people are trying to make an active decision between a number of alternatives for replacing and repairing the heating system. Now, the reason that I say replacing and repairing the heating system there is ultimately that's really what this decision looks like for most people. So if we look at the targets, we want 400,000 heat pumps to be retrofitted into existing homes. So they'll obviously usually have, in the vast majority of cases, some sort of heating system already. Um, and even in new builds, um, unless the person is usually doing a self-build, the consumer or the homeowner is not usually making the choice of what uh, heating technology is going to go into that dwelling. That might be de um, determined by the developer or by someone involved in the development of that particular uh, property. Um, so at that choosing stage, as I say, what, what people are really trying to do is trying to make that active decision. They're, they're saying, will I get a heat pump? Will I get... Um, a repair my current boiler, will I get a new boiler? And they're trying to choose between those different alternatives that they have in front of them. At the organizing stage then, this is where the person that we assume has pretty much decided that yes, okay, I'm going to install a heat pump. And now they're trying to coordinate and organize that installation. So they're ringing around to get quotes. They're uh, considering getting finance. They are applying for the FAI grant. They're doing all of these things. At the designing and installing phase, there's actually even some, still some work for the customer or for the homeowner to do. So they have to facilitate insulation. So as people come and go from the house, they have to be there to let them in and, and, and all that kind of thing. But they also sometimes have to make decisions with the contractor. So for example, on radiator placement or radiator sizing or 
on the exact placement of where the unit goes outside. And all of these kind of different decisions um, do usually involve the homeowner to some extent. And then finally, as I say, and this is really important, is once the, the heat pump has been installed and hopefully installed correctly and, and um, set up correctly, the customer still needs to operate the heat pump on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this will involve things like setting heating schedules, maintaining the heat pump after a bout of icy weather, for example, um, using the boost function or not using it, depending on what they choose to do. And all of the decisions and how, what they do during that operating phase can ultimately influence the level of savings that we see um, coming from the heat pump installation. And what I want to do now is just talk about the barriers to uptake and some of the solutions that we can apply. Um, I think the, the best thing to do is just to first show you the infographic that we put together to summarize all of our findings. So don't worry about reading this in detail. I've, I've blown these up into kind of a, a bigger scale on the next few slides. But what we wanted to do here was just take everything, all the findings from the paper and condense it into a brief infographic um, so that people can get a sense of what we're saying. And so what you can see here is we've simplified the customer journey a little bit into three stages just to fit into this one page. Um, you can see that we're very clearly trying to link each barrier to a potential solution. So for example, this low awareness and a poor understanding of heat pumps and uh, the potential solution linked to that is introducing national and community-based marketing campaigns. And we do this then for each of the barriers that we've identified. If you'd like a, a full breakdown of every single barrier and every single solution and where it applies across the customer journey, there's a spreadsheet that does that um, on the SEI website under the Behavioral Insights paper series that goes along with this paper. So let's have a look at some of those barriers um, to realizing the savings from heat pump adoption. These are in no particular order, but the first of them is what we call hyperbolic discounting. And this is really just the idea that people place a special value on now. So if I offered you the choice between 100 euro today and 105 euro tomorrow, most people will pick 100 euro today. But then if I offer those same people the choice between 100 euro in a year and 105 euro in a year and a day, most people are willing to wait the day. And this basically just means that we place this really strong value on now and heavily discount things out into the future. And what this means for heat pump adoption is that people will probably overly focus on the upfront cost and how that cost differs to other technologies of the heat pump and discount to some extent the potential for long run savings when it's actually operating. The next one is status quo bias and it's really hard to underestimate um, the strength of this barrier. Um, obviously, if we think about the fact that most people currently have installed, you know, either an oil boiler, a gas boiler, or potentially maybe rely on some solid fuel, Encouraging people to change from any of those technologies to a heat pump is difficult because they're not used to having a heat pump in their home or they're not familiar with how they work. And it's much easier, I suppose, for a consumer, especially in an uncertain decision making context to say, well, I know that this gas or oil boiler or whatever, I know how it works. I know how much it costs to run. I'll just go with that. I'll do the same thing, especially obviously in a context if they're doing this when their boiler is breaking down and they need to replace it quickly. So we shouldn't underestimate the strength of this barrier. Another is cost. Um, so heat pumps can, in some instances, be relatively expensive to install, especially if large retrofit works are needed beforehand to make the house suitable. Um, and so really this can act as a barrier, especially as I said already, the fact that that upfront cost looms very strongly in people's minds. The next barrier to realizing savings is complicated heating controls. So there's a series of studies from the UK that I'll mention in a couple of slides um, that really show that people struggle with all sorts of heating controls. So it's not just heat pump heating controls, it's smart heating controls and, and other more low tech solutions for, for heating controls. People just find it difficult to operate these and to set schedules correctly and so on. And then finally, as I said, there is quite a low level of awareness of heat pumps and certainly of understanding. So surveys and interviews conducted by a research team at UCD um, led by Lisa Ryan, they really found that there was this kind of low awareness and talking to um, consumers that they had this poor understanding of how heat pumps worked. And similarly, we ran a nationally representative survey last year 
asking people different questions about energy literacy. And one of the questions we had included was a multiple choice question basically saying, can you define what a heat pump is? And only uh, 33% of people could do that correctly. Okay, so let's look at some potential solutions. So the first, let's focus on that low awareness problem. So we need to obviously increase awareness and understanding. And one way we could do this is by holding targeted community events supported by national campaigns. So actually there's a nice example of this done in Denmark where they successfully ran a large number of targeted events to try and encourage people who are on oil to switch to heat pumps. Um, so they use their equivalent of the building energy rating database, the BER database, to identify people who are still using oil boilers and then invite them to local events. Um, and you can see from this map on the right that there were events held all across Denmark. And these events were typically about two hours long um, with an hour of kind of presentations on, you know, what a heat pump is. There was usually, a, they would have heat pumps there for people to, to see. Um, what the benefits were, the cost savings, all of these things. But importantly, we're followed by another hour for attendees to talk with installers and to book appointments for consultations. So for anyone who was kind of, if you like, convinced on the night, they made that next step super easy for them to follow up on. Um, I'll caveat this last point just with the finding that I'm going to talk about here, this 26% of respondents. That's obviously 26 of respondents to a particular survey and this study wasn't randomized, so please take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt, but you can see that 26% of respondents to this survey of attendees at these events stated that they'd switched away from oil since the event, and a large portion of those had switched to, to heat pumps. Another really important thing that we can do that, to help consumers make decisions and ultimately choose to install heat pumps is to provide simple online recommender tools. And what I've done here is I've just included some screenshots from the UK's recommender tool. And the first screenshot on top is really the questions that um, the consumer has to answer. So they have to just be able to say, you know, I live in a detached house. It was built roughly between these years. And, you know, have I done lots of insulation works? Yes, no. And once they answer these kind of basic questions, it spits out what you see at the bottom which in this case, obviously, they have a renewable heat incentive um, in the UK. So it tells them what the, power, the tariff payment would be and what that would look like over time. But you can imagine doing a very similar thing here with, with grants and with upfront costs. And what these tools really effectively do is help them narrow down what technology is right for them. So there's an air source heat pump, there's a ground source heat pump, there's an air to water, there's an air to air. There's all these different types of technologies. And as I say, where most people are not sure of what these technologies are, tools like this can help consumers understand these technologies and feel like they're selecting the right one for them. And maybe even more importantly, these tools also help remove kind of the large misestimates that people have in their mind about the savings. So people who are super enthusiastic about heat pumps, they really want one, they might overestimate the savings that they might get. And people who are pessimistic or don't know about heat pumps might actually underestimate the savings. And so what we want to do is give people a correct perception so that they can make a good informed decision for themselves. I think this is going to be key, right? And Jim mentioned it and so did Rob a couple of times already, that there's going to be need for a large scale provision of training of installers. Um, I think for two reasons. So one, obviously, to increase the supply um, of heat pump installers if we're going to hit the ramp rates that you saw in the graph presented by Rob. But also that we want each installation to be a quality installation, right? We want high quality design and high quality installation. Um, and what do I mean by that? So I think it's important that systems are well sized for each home's heating demand um, and installed correctly to minimize energy loss. So the focus of those kind of training um, scenarios or seminars should really be on things like avoiding undersizing so you don't create a reliance on a supplementary auxiliary heater um, and ensuring pipe work is well insulated. So from looking across both international studies and SEI inspections data, these are the areas where you want to focus in and, and really get right. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is the idea of providing sales training for installers uh, because that can help increase customer conversion and satisfaction. And let me just be really clear about what I mean by sales training here. I'm not referring to kind of, you know, pushy sales tactics or anything like that. What I mean here is really good communication sales training 
that helps installers maximize the customer satisfaction. So you see this being done in a number of programs in the States, and it really focuses in on things that seem relatively simple and benign, but have a large impact on customer experience. So for example, showing up on time when you set an appointment, um, cleaning away scrap materials at the end of the workday, um, but also talking to consumers in kind of a familiar language, avoiding overly technical language, um, and talking to customers about what their needs are and how the technology will fill that needs rather than talking about technical specifications. So the person wants a nice, comfortable home with a comfortable, sustainable level of heat at a relatively low cost. And that's, you know, what we should be talking to consumers about. So like I say, I'm sure a lot of installers are doing this already, but by embedding a training process into, or sorry, embedding these type of things into a training process, we can ensure that more and more people are saying the right things and that we're seeing more and more uptake of heat pumps, which is something I think we all want to see. I think it's also important to realize that retrofits, especially where we realize that the majority of people who are installing these heat pumps will probably have to do some other retrofit work as well at the same time, that this can be really complicated and can be kind of daunting for the consumer. So um, they find that it's a large administrative burden. They're kind of con trying to manage multiple contractors who were, might be subcontracted, for example. Um, and so one thing that we can do here is to try and encourage the development of one-stop shops uh, to try and help manage projects on the homeowner's behalf to make that more simple. And, and similarly, you know, because there's that high upfront cost that we talked about already, you know, baked into this offering ideally would be some sort of low cost finance offering as well to help people meet the upfront cost um, of heat pumps. Okay. Another thing I think is really key, especially to get those operational savings, is to simplify heat pump heating controls and ultimately to teach homeowners how to operate their system efficiently. So there's been a couple of previous UK studies where they bring people into the lab to work with different type of heating controls. Now, some of these were not heat pump controls. Some of them were just other smart heating controls. But what they found was that people really struggled to use these. So I think nearly none of the smart heating controls that were tested at that time in that study met a usability uh, index that they had set up for the study. So most people couldn't actually do things like set a proper heating schedule, uh, understand exactly when the system was uh, operating in boost mode versus not. And similarly, we see this from case studies as well. So case studies in the UK see that only about 50% of heat pump owners are, are really satisfied with their controls. Now, there's, there's lots of different reasons about this, and we will be doing more research on this this year to try and understand this in more detail. But some early suggestions from other studies that we read while doing research for this paper, it does seem clear that people want clearer feedback on savings and efficiency. So if you think about why they're installing it, they want to install a heat pump to save money on their energy bills, have a comfortable home, and to have a more efficient heating system. They want their heat, they want their heat pump controls to be able to show them that easily. So, you know, give a monetary estimate of how much they've saved, for example, or to have a very simple indicator of how efficient it is. And I don't mean a coefficient, um, I don't mean like the COP, I mean something closer to like an, you know, an amber light system where red means it's operating really poorly, orange is okay, and green is good. These are the, the type of things people want. Similarly, an indicator to show when the boost function is on so that they know that their system is using that boost function and that might be, be costly for them so that they can act on that. And this last point, which goes to this meme that I've copied and pasted into the bottom right, which is, I don't always read the instruction manual, but when I do, I don't. Um, I think no matter how well we design instruction manuals, people just won't read them to a certain extent. So some people will, or they'll read some of it, but even if we shorten it down to a couple of pages and it's really nice and graphical, a lot of people still won't read it. And so I think what we really need to do is teach people how to use their system. And this is really important for two reasons. One, as I said, people find the controls difficult to use, so they just need to actually be shown how to use this specific control. But two, if we think about the fact that most people don't understand heat pump systems, and what I think might be going on, and we'll be doing more research to confirm this, might be something along the lines of, if I think about how heating system works currently, I rely on what's called a mental model, so like a mental picture of something like a gas or an oil boiler. So I hit a button, the thing heats up real quick, and then I get 
space or water heating real quick. Most people, I suppose, don't understand that heat pumps obviously work more efficiently when you keep them running at a set specific temperature over long periods. And getting people to shift their mental model from oil gas boiler to how a heat pump works takes a bit of training and time. So we should invest in that. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are the factors that influence the savings that are ultimately achieved. There's a number of things that influence the savings. Um, so I've talked about insulation quality already, so fo focusing in on that pipe work and pipe insulation is really key. But system design and heat pump and the type of heat pump installed is also really important. Um, so you'll get different levels of savings depending on whether you install a ground source heat pump versus an air source heat pump. Um, and obviously, depending on how the suitability of, suitability of that particular heat pump matches up with the particular property in question. I've talked about accurate sizing already, but there's also some elements here that are subjective, right? So uh, again, I'm not going to go into this in super detail because I'm not a, uh, an engineer or a technical person. But from reading these studies, there just seems to be a number of choices that heat pump installers have to make when designing and installing a system that are subjective to a certain degree. Uh, and so really having a good theory-based understanding of what, what is a good or what is a less good or, sorry, what is a better or less bad decision uh, when we're making those subjective decisions will be really important. I think that comes back to the, the installer training piece. Um, on the customer side, so thinking from the consumer's perspective, um, the level of energy savings in terms of monetary savings that they make is really influenced actually by their pre and post energy tariff, um, which is obviously closely linked to this next point around what fuel type they were on previously. But how much they are paying before and how much they pay after is, is, is a big deal. Um, so there are certain uh, companies, so I think Electric Ireland in Ireland, for example, offer a tariff specifically designed for heat pumps. Um, and whether or not people basically optimize which tariff they move to after they've installed a heat pump can largely impact, to a very large degree, how much savings they actually make. And then finally, as I said already, you know, homeowners' behavior and use of controls will also influence the savings. So if they're leaving the heat pump running all day, but also leaving the doors and windows open all day, it won't work to the same degree as if they didn't do that. And similarly, if they're not setting correct heating schedules or if they're boosting all the time, uh, again, that might lower operational performance. Uh, and what I want to talk about on this slide here is really just to say actually and acknowledge just quite how difficult getting this stuff right is. Um, and so on the left, what I've tried to do is just give an illustration of what any single installer is really trying to balance when they're trying to uh, correctly install any given system. They really have to do this complex balancing act between the homeowner's needs and the technical requirements of that system. So you've got the heating demands of the homeowner. You know how much, uh, how warm the house you want, how warm do you want your house to be? How often? How quickly? Um, the noise concerns of oh, don't install it right there because the rattling will annoy me, or things like that, or um, the aesthetics of radiator sizing and placement. You know, I don't want the radiator right there because actually I don't like the way it looks in the room, and so on. And at the same time, they're balancing this up against technical requirements, so design flow temperatures, trying to design the system for peak load. Um, doing weather compensation, choosing whether they should use default U values or measured U values, depending on whether they're available or not. This is really difficult, um, and I think it's just worth acknowledging that. And even looking into the detail uh, on the right here, this is some of the fields that uh, heat pump assessors and designers have to fill out when they are calculating different values that they need to, to design the system. And just look at the amount of different numbers they have to install, or sorry, that they have to um, uh, enter into the spreadsheet. You know, and what we want here is to make this system as foolproof as possible, right? We want it to catch values that look totally irregular to w provide a warning to installers and say, by the way, have you, you know, double check this figure? Like you could be right, but this seems like an, an anomalous value, for example. Uh, and so anything we can do there to simplify those calculations simplify that process and give people feedback, I think will be useful. This next piece, I just want to look a little bit at who might be most likely to install a heat pump. And a lot of these studies come from survey experiments um, and come from 
relatively small case studies. Um, so what I'd say is take this next slide with a little bit of grain of salt, uh, or a little bit of a paint, pinch of salt, and, and just accept that, you know, I think they might point, point us in the right direction, but I wouldn't say it's um, to be followed to the, to the nth degree, let's say. So the following groups from these early studies seem to suggest that these groups of people are more likely to install a heat pump. So movers, so people who are moving into a new home or more likely moving into a second home. So they're buying a, a secondhand home and they're moving into their second home, for example. These people are usually going to be considering doing other upgrades to the home any, anyway, whether they be aesthetic or whether they be energy efficiency related. And so it can be easier to get them to do a heat pump install at that time. People who have larger homes, um, because the savings potential is much larger. So if you have a large home and it's already relatively well insulated, then the savings you can get from heating that space more efficiently with a heat pump are much larger. And obviously, I caveat that a little bit with the fact that if your home isn't well insulated and it's much larger, then the cost to insulate it well will be larger as well, and that might deter people. So it's, like I said, each of these isn't, um, isn't a complete truth in and of itself, just it should be taken into consideration. People who are on oil as well, people who have um, oil boilers currently um, can see potentially large financial savings between the difference in the, the cost of running an oil boiler versus a heat pump. Again, depending on the level of insulation in their house. A similar story for electricity users. Um, tech enthusiasts uh, or early adopters, if you like, so people who are really into new technology, um, these people are more likely to install a heat pump because I suppose it's easier for them to kind of overcome this status quo bias because they like um, new things anyway. They like experiencing new technology. A lower or a higher BER, um, so I'm not trying to hedge my bets there. Really what I'm trying to say is that there are different incentives for different people with different BER ratings. So at the lower end, if you're going to be buying, let's say a new, or sorry, buying a, a home with a low BER, with a low poor BER rating, then you might be more likely to do other works anyway. And so you might install a heat pump while you're doing that. And then on the flip side, if you have a higher BER, so if your house is a C1, let's say, for example, and it's relatively well insulated, but you still, for some reason, have an oil boiler, those people might be much more likely to do um, a heat pump install because it's relatively easy to simply just install a heat pump and not have to do a lot of retrofit work alongside it. Um, and then, as I said, there does seem to be some correlation between both having high education and being of high socioeconomic status. So being a professional managerial um, type positions with high income, um, they seem to be positively correlated with the intention to install a heat pump as well. So I'm just going to summarize the important findings to keep in mind, um, and then we can go to questions and answers afterwards. So I think the important findings to really keep in mind are that People's tendency to continue with the status quo is extremely strong. It will take significant investment in demand generation and other policies to encourage people to adopt heat pumps. So let's not underestimate the uh, strength of that challenge. Insulation quality can have large impacts on the savings achieved. And as a result, I think standards, training and on-site support are all going to be critical and crucial. People find it hard to assess whether a heat pump is right for them, especially in the current context where awareness and understanding is low. And so we should develop a lot online tools and calculators to help people make those decisions more easily. How people operate their system will impact the savings achieved. And so this might say something that we should consider doing things like requiring householder training across all grant programs. And finally, heat pump system design is really difficult, even for skilled workers. I had a look at some of the equations for you know, figuring out the optimal design flow temperature. I don't want to look at those equations again. They're quite scary. Um, so anything that we can do where we simplify calculations, provide technical support so that instead of people making a gut decision on the ground, they can ring and get some, some technical support, or introducing checklists where appropriate, I think all of these things can only really help uh, insulation quality. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, pop up this slide and see there's my email on the bottom left if anyone would like to contact me. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm going to hand over to Andrew O'Callaghan now who's going to moderate our question and answer session. So I'll be happy to take part in that. Thanks everybody. Andrew, over to you.
Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we have plenty of questions and answers uh, coming in uh, at the moment. So I'm going to go through these. Uh, some of these will be more relevant for Rob, perhaps, uh, or for Jim, or for yourself. But I'll start off one, with one for you, Carl. So there's one here from Emerson O'Callaghan who asks, how do Ireland's heat pump adoption statistics compare to other EU countries? And are there anything that we can learn from our EU neighbours or from any other country for that matter in terms of successfully encouraging heat pump adoption? So are there any international success stories when it comes to uh, heat pump adoption? Um, yeah, OK. So to answer that question, I'm just going to not jump into the statistics part of it because I know I'll get those figures wrong. So there's a great report from the IERC that does a great uh, comparison across Europe and Ireland. So I can I can share that afterwards and they'll answer that question better than I can on the international examples, yeah, I think there are some stuff that we can learn. So there are some international examples around kind of, you know, putting together one-stop shop type solutions with low-cost finance. Like I said, I do think that that would really help. Um, there are that exa there was that example that I mentioned from Denmark around kind of community energy events. I, you know, obviously at the moment COVID makes that a little bit difficult, but hopefully when we're in a situation to do that again, you can imagine the power of going into communities and and having those presentations and helping people feel a lot more comfortable with the technology. So I think I think that's something that we could do as well. That's great, Carl. Thanks. Um, Rob, there's perhaps a question here for you from Brian Coyne, who has a question about the, the EU green, uh, green Deal. So he's asking, with the new EU Green Deal, seeking to spur residential energy efficiency by improved financing, is, there something, is this something that SEAI will explore? Uh, the temporal misalignment of investment uh, in terms of costs and benefits can really hinder the mainstream adoption. So I think more of a uh, more of a policy question there, if uh, there for Rob. Yeah, th th thanks for the question. Um, if financing is going to be a huge component. It's, it's one of the main pillars. I mean, if we think about it, in, it the, the framework that we're using, we're looking at driving demand, ensuring that the supply chain is there, and having uh, the, the, the finance for people to actually be able to pay for it, and then governance and, and, and making sure that we have the, the appropriate structures in place. So finance is one of those core components. If, if you pick up the copy of the program for government, retrofit is riddled throughout the program for government. It, it's a very high profile initiative for the government and financing of those projects. There's, a, there's several references there. So we're working with SEAI, the Department of Finance, SBCI to come up with new financing and funding met methods that can fit in with those one-stop shops uh, that, that, that Carl has referred to a couple of times now that are going to be key. So it'll be about new financing and funding mechanisms on top of the the, uh, the SEAI grants. So it's making sure that those financing and funding methods align properly. And we already have a very strong commitment uh, from government in, in, in terms of the exchequer commitment to this. Uh, between the National Development Plan and the Programme for Government, there's 8.7 billion euros uh, uh, that has been allocated for delivery of our retrofit targets and uh, as a component of that, the installation of heat pumps. So like, while we're kind of talking about a lot of the challenges, I think it's also important to frame this as a massive opportunity for the industry and for, 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 for the householders on the one side before the supply chain on the other. Uh, this is a, an area that the government is very, very committed to delivering on. Uh, it's part of our uh, NECP and um, financing is, is, is absolutely going to be a key component as well as part of the national development plan discussions that are ongoing. There's a, an ongoing review of that. So in answer to the question, lots happening on that and there'll be uh, further developments on top of the, the announcements that were made at the budget. So uh, in, I, I, I realise I'm going on a bit now, but there was uh, an additional 100 million euros found for the, the, the SEAI schemes this year. Uh, there's been two uh, calls for projects under that and they've been very well received from the, from the market. So financing in terms of grant schemes, there's a lot of work going on in that and alternative financing mechanisms. There's a separate strand of work ongoing on that. That's great, Rob. Thanks for that. I actually might stick with you, Rob, for this next question and perhaps this is well one that Jim Shear might like to step in for as well. There's been a few questions actually about the, the types of heat technologies that are being supported currently um, in the context over the next few decades. So there's a few questions coming in on uh, other technologies in terms of biogas, biomass, etc. So there's a question here from uh, Tom Lynch. So are SEAI planning on educating the public on all heating upgrade solutions? So obviously today we're focused on heat pumps, but there's a question here on um, will we focus on other technologies in terms of biogas, biomass boilers, etc. or 
uh, it's just solely heat pumps. So um, that's more of a long run question that perhaps Jim might like to step in for as well. Um, but uh, I'll leave it open to either of you there. Do you want me to go, Jim? Or do you want? Well, the, 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 the origin of the, uh, the, the heat pump target is the program for government and the climate action plan. So there's a very hard number there that we're working to. But there's also wider uh, work going on on alternative approaches, whether it be district heating or, 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 or biomass, by gas, whatever your, uh, your, your, your um, questioner there was, was, was asking about. So this is one important component of it, but it's not necessarily going to be the answer for everyone. Uh, but it is going to be, it's, it's certainly the focus of uh, the, the, the ongoing efforts at the moment in terms of trying to rapidly increase activity on that front. That's great. Well, thanks very much. I might just add to that that there's, a, there's an ongoing study um, that, that uh, SEAI is conducting for, for the department on full decarbonisation of, of the heat sector in Ireland, which includes a look at the, the, the residential stock. Uh, it looks at the target for 2030 and also uh, the net zero pathway for 2050, which will include all of those, that, that wider list of technologies that, uh, that Rob and, and Tony referred to in the question there as well. So uh, the, I think we need to keep analysing, you know, what, what these pathways are and what technologies are relevant um, uh, as we go. But I think we, we're pretty clear that heat pumps is, is, is firmly on that list where, where they make sense. For example, um, in, in oil dwellings that, that, that are nowhere near a gas grid or um, have, have a low likelihood of being relevant for, for future connection to a district heating uh, network. And of course, there's, there's a lot of questions and, and, and good comments coming in around the need to have uh, good insulation and air tightness first. And, and obviously, there's a, there's a debate at that theme around what is the right HLI, uh, how tight should a house be, and there's, there's a lot of experimentation going on in that area still, and there's still a lot of learning about how this technology performs in, in, in the Irish context. That's great. Thanks for that, Jim. Uh, Carl, one, one here for you uh, from, trying to keep track of names here, uh, from Stephen Howland, who has a question about, uh, I, I guess it's really getting at the split incentive problem um, when it comes to rented accommodation. So currently the vast majority um, of apartments, there's uh, storage heating. Um, what can we do to incentivize landlords to encourage them uh, to switch their heating systems uh, and perhaps uh, install a heat pump? Yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one. Um, I know that there was a, a working group looking at this problem, and so not, not to sidestep the question, but Rob actually might have an update on that group. I don't know. Would you like to answer that? Yeah, no, no problem, Carl. Um, so there was a consult, public consultation last year. Uh, that was the, fine, the submissions have been analysed. Uh, and have already fed into changes in terms of two of the grant schemes in that we've increased the intensity of the grant levels that are available for landlords to, to retrofit their homes. Uh, there's more work to be done and, and there's a commitment that there be further recommendations made to the Minister this year. Uh, but this is a really tricky problem. Uh, we're not alone in, in, in this whole uh, split incentive, we're find, finding it difficult to tackle this split incentive issue. And whatever we do, we need to kind of keep it in the wider context of the supply of rental accommodation in the market. So we need to be careful that what we do doesn't have unintended consequences in terms of uh, adding fuel to a, 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 a pretty significant problem in terms of supply of rental accommodation and driving up costs for, 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 all, for renters. That's great, Rob. Thank, thanks very much for that. Um, Carl, just one here from Shane Kelly. Uh, who asked that when when we speak to installers, uh, installers can often be plumbers or electricians. So when you talk about training, uh, so this question is about training for installers. Uh, is this referring to plumbers? Is it referring to electricians? Uh, what trades are we focusing on here? And who is expected to um, to be able to design the heat pump system? So I think it's really more about an audience question. Who uh, th these training programs that you speak of and the examples that you drew upon there? What type of audience are these geared towards uh, in the examples that are included in the, in the report? Yeah, so I'll just take that question in two parts. So I think, you know, in terms of who exactly it's going to be aimed at, I suppose we'll we'll see that come out of other work that's ongoing um, about determining the level of supply that's needed and the type of skills that's needed in, in that particular sector of the job market. So I don't want to preempt that. But one thing I will say is there, there probably is elements of it that apply to anyone that's installing a heat pump system. So 
for example, like I was mentioning, the, the kind of sales training element of being able to communicate clearly the benefits of the system, uh, ex explain kind of the differences between how a heat pump system works versus an oil or gas boiler. I think really anyone involved in heat pump design or installation should be able to answer those questions because uh, let me just take an example. Um, you know, for example, someone might be on site in your house doing a bit of work, and you won't know necessarily. Right? Is that the plumber? Is that the electrician? You know, is, are they responsible for design? But at the same time, the homeowner might stop you and just say, "By the way, like, you know, roughly, actually, how does this thing work? Or, you know, can I do this or X with the system? Would that be silly from an operationally efficient point of view?" I think everyone who's going to be either on site or involved with the installation design should be able to answer those basic questions for the homeowner. So that the, the homeowner always feels like they're getting confident, assured answers um, and that they themselves then feel more confident and assured in, in uh, that they've made the right choice. That's great. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, there's one here, perhaps uh, perhaps question for Rob again, actually. It's one from, uh, sorry, just the question has shifted off my screen. Um, it's from Pora Connolly, who asks, uh, who's asking a question about the skills um, the skills that are available in the market and if there is a skills shortage uh, in the context of our of our 2030 target for heat pumps and what's been done to ensure that uh, those skills are available to uh, to, uh, to help us to achieve that target. Yeah, I was just looking through the question there and that's kind of a recurring trend uh, it's, and, and it's, it is a big issue and it kind of points back a little bit to what I said earlier then the development of the supply chain and skills development needing to increase at the same rate as the delivery targets that we have uh, for, for, for heat pumps and, and retrofit. So there's a few things that's been done on that. Uh, there's already been new centres of excellence announced by the Department of Further and Higher Education uh, over the Christmas breaks there. So there'll be additional training, uh, upskilling and reskilling courses available this year. But kind of looking out to the longer term, there's a, a big block of work, a big exercise being done by the Department of Business and Enterprise around uh, the expert group of future skills needs, quantifying the skills needs that we have. And the idea is that that would then inform the work of the Department of Further and Higher Education and, and, and SULAS, the ETBs, in terms of making sure that we have the courses available to deliver the quantity of people that we need. Now, obviously, putting on training is one thing, getting people to do it is another. So we need to persuade people that this is a good, long-term sustainable industry uh, it's part of the new green economy uh, it's um while we talk about the next 10 years and the targets in the next 10 years this is actually a 30-year program of work to retrofit, retrofit the whole housing stock so it's not just a 10-year it's a career it's a career path it's a long-term uh, uh it's a long-term career so it's about kind of convincing people to do it in the first place reskilling people who are like we, we need people who are plumbers at the moment to 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 enhance their skills and uh, train themselves on how to fit heat pumps. Uh, but then we need people from other sectors to also switch into the to the area in order to get the numbers of people that we need. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, there's actually a few questions, uh, just like I scroll through here, there's, we have a few questions actually about uh, learnings from the deep retrofit uh, pilot program, um, which obviously uh, incorporates a lot of heat pump installations. I'm not sure if this is one perhaps for Carl or for Jim, maybe. Uh, just wondering what were the what were the experiences of the deep retrofit pilot program. Now, unfortunately, we don't have um, anyone from the program on the call to, or on the webinar today. But uh, what were the experiences of homeowners in uh, in having a heat pump installed and and uh, and uh, making that learning? So maybe one for for Carl or for Jim there. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of experience with that scheme, Jim. I don't know if you uh, if you have something you want to add there. We're still gathering data from that scheme, and I think uh, an evaluation of that program is, is is underway. So I think we'll offer to share the findings of that uh, in, in future. Um, I think there's a number of studies going on across different universities on. Uh, how people are uh, living uh, and breathing with air pumps in the house, how they're how they're using them, uh, looking at the load patterns, and um, you know this this uh, you know how do we behave around a new technology uh, when we're used to pressing boost on the boiler and and that's that's no longer an efficient way to use it. And uh, I guess in the work that you you guys are doing and 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 what's coming out is is how you know the kinds of conversations we can have with homeowners that have those 
uh, new technologies installed uh, to, to educate them and to have them understand how to get the most out of them um, and, and to, to, to get the most benefit as well for, for, for the national market. So I think that's uh, something that we need to keep continue to watch and, and uh, share learnings with as we, as we develop them. Yeah, and, and one thing I will say is that uh, I think it will be really important to see all the findings that come out from the studies that are on ground that Jim is referring to. But one thing I did find coming up when putting this report together was there are a lot of uh, very good case studies and field, and to a certain extent, field trials of, um, that took place in England um, as well and, and across the UK. Um, and so there's some references in that report, in our report online, and I encourage people to, to have a read through those. So. There's one by UCL in particular where um, they review something like 600 different heat pump installations and they go all the way from socio-technological uh, issues to purely technical issues. So how people find their system to operate all the way to what was the actual coefficient of performance in different types of houses and so on. And look, we all know that findings like that mightn't always be directly transplantable, but at least it gives you some insight into the type of things that we'd want to be thinking about and the research questions that we would hope to answer in the, the coming year. So I'd encourage people to read those as well. That's great, Cara. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm mindful of the time here, and we've gone certainly gone over the uh, the 45 minutes that we initially allocated for this webinar. Um, so I think I might actually hand over to Jim now just to wrap things up here. Um, so thanks again uh, to Carl and uh, to Rob, and over to you, Jim. That's great. Thanks, Andrew, um, for hosting the session. Very conscious we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but I want to thank you all for participating and, and for those questions uh, and invite you to stay in touch with us. We're going to pass on all of the comments and questions to other parts of SEAI uh, and DEC working in this area. So they're all very much appreciated and, and very useful, uh, even if we didn't get to answer them all today. Uh, we certainly learned a lot uh, and, and have a lot more to chew on uh, as we work together to to deliver this scale up, um, uh, and, and we appreciate those contributions. So thanks to Carl and, and, and the team for, for the work. Uh, thanks very much to, to Rob Deegan uh, and colleagues at DEC for, for their close collaboration and, and, and drive for this work. Um, uh, again, thanks, thanks to you all for participating. You, you, you'll all receive a copy of the presentations and the reports are online. Uh, the recording of this session will be made available, so please feel free to share that with your colleagues. Uh, we have an urgent decarbonisation challenge. Today we talked about what we see as one part of the solution with a lot more work to do, uh, and we need all of you who are on today to help with that. We appreciate the contributions, and, and we hope this session has been helpful for you to push the, push the climate action agenda forward. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your day and, uh, and stay in touch. Thanks again. <laughs>